Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Douglasville Seventh-day Adventist Church's Sabbath School class. Uh, let's bow our heads for prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, we just ask now in the name of Jesus that you please send your Holy Spirit to be with us. Please guide our speech and our thinking and instruct us uh, as to your will. And we request that as a result of being here and studying your Holy Word that we would be um, change for the better and to become more like you in Jesus name I pray amen <clears throat> okay this week's lesson is called a step in faith I'm going to uh, read the memory verse and then I'd like to have um, some discussion about it and I have a question but says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man. Now, I <clears throat> looked into this some, um, and I can probably go by my memory a little bit but is there a difference between a servant and a bond servant and I believe the King James version just says servant but this is taken from the new King James version I believe it said and it used the term bond servant does anybody have any ideas of what the difference in the two are well historically a bond servant is someone that got into debt got themselves into trouble and basically turned themselves over to the person they were in debt to to work off the debt, which was usually done in a way that was not equal. They were pretty much a servant most of their lives, no matter how much the debt was. But that's the idea. Whereas an, any other servant may have been um, the result of captured in a war, sold from another person. They may have been born that way. It, um, it just has to do with how you got yourself into it. And a bond servant had the ability to potentially become free if they paid off the debt. Yes. And some of my looking into it, I think, to a servant, which if you look in just a modern-day dictionary or something, um, you know, like you said, he has this sense of freedom, and also he's most likely working for wages or receiving something for his services as to where um, the bond servant you know, he more or less doesn't have any rights, and he's working either to pay off a debt or maybe receiving nothing. Okay. <clears throat> Further in the lesson here, it says, Jesus came to this world of suffering and death in order to reveal the Father's character of love, to win back the affection of the human race, and to redeem all humankind. Never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the Redeemer before the throne of God. Amen. Then as the glories of the eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses, we shall remember that Jesus left all of this for us, that he not only became an exile from the heavenly court, but for us, took the risk of failure and eternal loss. Then we shall cast our crowns at his feet and raise the song, worthy is the lamb that was slain, to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, and honor and glory and blessings. The sacrifice that Christ has made for our salvation is incalculable. When we respond to this leading, accept his command and unite with him, in reaching lost people for his kingdom, it calls for sacrifice. Although our sacrifices can never in any way compare to his, soul-willing soul ministry is a leap in faith for us as well. It leads us out of our comfort zone into uncharted waters. At times, our Lord calls us to make sacrifices, but the joy he offers are far greater.
Okay, and the lesson helps. It says, when we study the divine character in the light of the cross, we see mercy, tenderness, and forgiveness blended with equity and justice. We see in the midst of the throne one bearing in hands and feet and side the marks of the suffering endured to reconcile man to God. We see a father, infinite, dwelling into light, unapproachable, yet receiving us to himself through the merits of his son. In the contemplation of Christ, we linger on the shore of a love that is measureless. We endeavor to tell of his love, and language fails us. We consider his life on earth, his sacrifice for us, his work in heaven as our advocate, and the mansions he is preparing for those who love him. And we can only exclaim, oh, the height and depth of the love of Christ. In every true disciple, this love, like sacred fire, burns on the altar of the heart. It was on the earth that the love of God was revealed through Christ. It is on the earth that his children are to reflect this love through blameless lives. Thus, sinners will be led to the cross to behold the Lamb of God. You know, I, I think that um, we look at the, the, the life that Jesus had here, and relatively it was pretty short in the grand, the grand scheme of eternity. But in that text, uh, or the quote you read earlier, the risk of eternal failure, the risk of failure and eternal loss, that's what changes it. Because he did it even if it would have been permanent. Yes. And part of, the, part of it is permanent because he still has the scars, does he not? Yes. He still has a human form, does he not? Um, that's a big deal. I don't think we understand that yet. I don't understand it, but I can see that that's a big deal. He went from God, who's everywhere, do anything, spoke the world into existence, to taking my form with scars for the rest of eternity. Marvelous that, condescension. Wouldn't you say? That's a big deal. That's a, that's a huge, huge step down, in my perspective, that's right. from where he was. Yeah, and it right. wasn't just for 34 years. Yeah. This is forever. That's right. Um, if we only look at the life he had here on this earth and don't contemplate that risk that he would have done it if it was permanent and what, it ha and what has become permanent, I think we almost cheapen it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I've tried to contemplate this. Now, inspiration in no way tells us what would have happened if he had failed, okay? But now, his motivation was his love for us, but the other part that was extremely important was to bring eternal stability to the universe. Because well, which, as long as a doubt of God's goodness or um, not sure if... Of, of his character, you know, the character of God, not really knowing for sure what he was about. As long as that lingered there, there was always the potential or problem for this to happen, I think, again and again. And so the question, the statement about at the risk, you know, of loss, like I said, we, we don't know exactly what would have happened, but he would have been identified with sinners. His well, humanity would have. So what would have been the result of that? So it was a fearful thing that he went through. It wasn't just about redeeming us in that aspect for him mm -hmm. because really that would have kind of been secondary. He could have just left us alone and just said, well, just perish. Well, of course, there's a twofold part of that. One is the revelation of God's love. Yes. The other one's the revelation of Satan's evil and lies. Yes. Because... To fully um, reveal one, you're fully revealing the other. Yes. Um, and if it would have been permanent, it would have revealed the same thing. Satan is a murderer. He killed God. Of course, the resurrection nullified that, but it didn't well, nullify the, the consequences. But it did not um, nullify the revelation. Satan's a murderer, and God would die. So 
in that aspect, that would have still been revealed. And, I, and that's part of why sin will never come back again, because we see the result. And that's the importance of the scars in the hands to remind us Amen. of the, um, of if, if, if anyone was ever to rebel against God again, it would result in the same thing again. Um, yes. And no one wants that. In other words, there, there, there's no question. Before there's question, Satan's a liar, and he's brought into question God's character and his love, and he's saying he's not, you know, against love. He's saying he's not evil. He's saying it won't lead to this. Well, it did. And there's no question about that anymore. And um, the, the universe knows it. So in the end, I, you know, that revelation part of it wouldn't have changed if he hadn't have risen now. Yeah, the, the promise that sin will never rise again is eternal. Yes. You know, just as God is. And that's the, that's the beauty of the whole plan, isn't it? Never again. Well, and I think the importance of it, it that it won't rise again is because there's a witness in him and there's a witness in us yeah of the result so through all eternity because yeah. th uh, of course we cannot be naive to think that god will not continue to create once the war, you know once this is over so there will be new beings that yeah. did not witness this firsthand mm. that will need to be you know taught yeah told told the story yeah. and, 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 and There'll be two witnesses, at least, us and Christ. Amen. Amen. And, and we will be able to relay that story to them. And that will be a blessing to both, I believe. Amen. <clears throat> okay, further in the helps, it says, Christ was not insensible to ignominy and disgrace. He felt it all most bitterly. He felt it as much more deeply and acutely than we feel suffering as his nature was more exalted and pure and holy than that of the sinful race for whom he suffered. <clears throat> he was the majesty of heaven. He was equal with the Father. He was the commander of the host of angels. Yet he died for man the death that was, above all others, clothed with ignominy and reproach. Oh, that the haughty hearts of men might realize this. Oh, that they might enter into the meaning of redemption and seek to learn the meekness and lowliness of Christ. So, you know, really, <clears throat> in thinking about that and, and then looking at uh, humans, those who have uh, actually humbled themselves and have become like Christ to some degree, the greater our reflection of Christ, the more sensitive that we would be to suffering. You know, those who are hard-hearted and rebellious, uh, seems like sometimes whenever bad things happen they seem to move on as if nothing has happened but a person that has become like Christ and has a sensitive heart and a sensitive nature and is more sensible to uh, and sensitive to suffering this right here is an indication that, that because of Christ and his sinlessness that he felt suffering far more than we ever do because sin does harden the heart and it makes us to where, you know, we're hard, and sometimes it's hard to even touch our hearts or even make an impression upon us about anything. Also, a uh, finish it said, in this life, we can only begin to understand the wonderful theme of redemption. With our finite comprehension, we may consider most earnestly the shame and the glory, the life and the death, the justice and the mercy that meet in the cross. Yet with the utmost stretch of our mental powers, we fail to grasp its full significance. The length, the breadth, the depth, and the height of redeeming love are but dimly comprehended. The plan of redemption will not be fully understood, even when the ransomed see as they are seen and know as they are known. But through the eternal ages, new truth will continually unfold to the wondering and delighted mind. Though the griefs and pains and temptations of earth are ended and the cause removed, the people of God will ever have a distinct 
intelligent knowledge of what their salvation has cost. The cross of Christ will be the science and the song of redeemed through all eternity. In Christ glorified will be hold Christ crucified. I, I think part of, I, I think part of that that we're um, we don't understand now. I don't, and I, and I think we'll learn is the dynamic that happened between Jesus and the Father at the cross. Because mm -hmm. that's really what it was all about. God gave his son. Christ laid down his life. He lost sight of the Father. The Father veiled himself. He, you know, the risk was all about whether that break between him and the Father would be permanent. That's the only risk there was. Yeah. Um, would it be enough? Would it be enough? And, and it was sin that evil that it would break their bond and relationship permanently. That, I don't understand that, but that's really what the cross was all about. That was the broken heart. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the mechanical means that man, that man did to put him on the cross and, and destroy his body was not what killed him. It was that dynamic between him and the Father that was cut. And um, that's something when, we're, when we see them both and we can communicate, we will still learn about through eternity is what Amen. exactly happened yeah. between them. I don't, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't understand it now. But I know something happened very significant. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's go forward to me. Sunday. It asks a question. It says, how do these verses reveal the heart of Christ, thinking and the pattern that governed his entire life? And the scripture is Philippians 2, 5 to 11. <clears throat> and it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the question I ask, how do these verses reveal the heart of Christ's thinking and the pattern that governed his entire life? Sacrificial. All. Everything he did was either to glorify his father or to help his fellow man. Yeah. Nothing was done to make his own life any easier or to figure out how he could bring some comfort or ease to himself. Yeah. Never entered his mind. Just intense love for us. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> From all eternity, Jesus was equal with God. Paul declares this eternal truth in these words, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. The word translated as form is the Greek word, I'm not sure what that is. It means the very essence of a thing. It links two things that are equal value. It says the SDA Bible commentary puts it this way, this places Christ on an equality with the Father and sets him far above every other power. Paul stresses that in order to portray more vividly the depths of Christ's voluntary humiliation, speaking of his eternal nature, in Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. Mm -hmm. Since Jesus was equal with God from all eternity, made himself of no reputation, this is also a fascinating Greek expression. It literally can be translated emptied. Jesus voluntarily emptied himself of his privileges and prerogatives as God's equal to take on the form of man and become 
a humble servant of humanity. As a servant, he revealed heaven's law of love to the entire universe and eventually performed the ultimate act of love on the cross. He gave his life to save ours eternally. The essence of Jesus' thinking was self-sacrificial love. To follow Jesus means that we love as he loved, serve as he served, and minister as he ministered. Allowing Jesus through his Holy Spirit to empty us of selfish ambitions will cost us something. It costs Jesus everything. But scripture says of Jesus, Therefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Heaven will be worth any sacrifice that we make on earth. Amen. There will be sacrifices along the way, but the joys of service will outweigh them today. And the eternal joy of living with Christ throughout all eternity will make any sacrifice we make here seem insignificant. You know, um, <clears throat> when, when you talk about the empty, completely empty in himself of his godliness, but then he relied on the spirit, which was outside of himself, came from God. It's easy to think that he had, or we want to think he had an advantage, and that's why we can't, do, we're not doing the same things he did. Now, I'm not talking about dying for some other people. I'm talking about living the life that he lived on earth and selflessness to others. If he was completely empty of his Godhead and relied on the Spirit, how should we be any different? You know, um, through, you know, if we rely on the Spirit also, should we not have the same attitude that he had? And I'm not, uh, <coughs> and I think we want to deny that because we want to continue walking in the way we are. Yeah, th and that's what we're called for, Rob. Uh, called to a life of service and giving. And uh, we're just naturally selfish, aren't we? And uh, he is naturally selfless and proved it. <coughs> but isn't that the command and power that he said he would give? Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's I mean, not, it's it, not it, that we don't it's have not the this power to do miraculous things. It's the yeah. power of the spirit to yeah. change. To change us, to, to turn us into selfless people, too. Yes. And I think if um, we don't want that, we got a problem. Yeah. Well, and that is a gift, isn't it? The gift and it's, of service. And it's not about doing miraculous things, it's about loving other people. Yeah. And, and having a willingness to serve. And so if I don't want that, if I, what am I saying? I don't want to love other people? Yeah, yeah, if you don't do that, what are you saying? You don't even have to really, say it. isn't that what you were saying? It just shows. Yeah, if, if I don't want to be like Christ, or I don't think it's possible, it's saying I don't want to love other people like He did. Well, I think sometimes uh, in my own life, and I think about, contemplate what I've heard, what I've been taught, and then what I've studied myself, and what's been implied, and what I've heard, because you know I was raised in this church and. <clears throat> I think it's easy to misunderstand um, what the mission of Christ was and what he expects from us because the leaders and the people in Christ's day, they had a total misunderstanding of the mission of Christ, of his character, and they spent most of their time worrying about being defiled or not sinning or not doing something wrong. but. Christ is far more concerned about our character and becoming like him. There are plenty of habits that in and of themselves, they're bad for the body or they're whatever, and they can have an effect on a person's character, but they are not the person's character. You know, all of these things were summed up in we are supposed to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. That in and of itself doesn't necessarily have anything to do with smoking a cigarette or drinking or whatever, even though those things are bad for the body. But because I'm not doing those things, that doesn't mean I'm a good Christian. 
It doesn't mean I'm representing Christ to my fellow man. It doesn't even mean I'm, I'm serving him. So, you know, all of us are a product of our environment and how we were raised, but that in and of itself might not be the truth, or we may have wrong ideas just like Christ's disciples. He had a hard time trying to retrain them and to undo what they had been taught, just like the things we talked about previously in lessons when, when they went to Samaria. You know, we talked all about the rules and to have nothing to do with those people and don't do any favors for them and don't socialize with them. And they thought because of that, hey, they were being a Christian or, or uh, representing God, but nothing could be further from the truth. It's, uh, yeah. Yes, Dan. Yeah, it's hard to say that the time comes and it says, Jesus, who was he was to God? There's no mankind on earth who is he was to God. So when we look back, he said we are And that's because he sent the helper. I, I mean, yeah, the right. same spirit that led him into the wilderness, he said, us. I will give to you when I leave. Right. And that's the only way. I mean, uh, because we aren't absolute sinners and sinful, there's, uh, there's no possible way for me to love others without his spirit. It's just not there. Now, to go back to what you were saying, John, about you know people being perfect in their hearts, but not in their bodies. What an eye opener for me that was, just from, from, from what you said. And you know, it goes back to what Litchfield said last week. You know, the best testimony that the Seventh Adventist Church can have is cigarette butts in the parking lot. Okay. Yes. Because people, you know, people who have some of these habits that are that are health destroying, still have minds that love Jesus and want to be here with us, yes. with Him. Yeah. Yes. You know. <coughs> further helps uh, on Sunday's lesson it said in consenting to become man Christ manifested a humility 
that is the marvel of the heavenly intelligences. The act of consenting to be a man would be no humiliation were it not for the fact of Christ's exalted preexistence. We must open our understanding to realize that Christ laid aside his royal robe, his kingly crown, his high command, and clothed his divinity with humanity, that he might meet man where he was and bring to the human family moral power to become the sons and daughters of God. To redeem, to redeem man, Christ became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And the last one here is, this is the grand and heavenly theme that has in a large degree been left out of the discourses because Christ is not formed within the human mind. And Satan has had his way that it shall be thus that Christ should not be the theme of contemplation and adoration. This name, so powerful, so essential, should be on every tongue. <clears throat> so the contemplation of Christ and the sacrifice he made and his condescension to become a man is what we are supposed to contemplate. And then, as far as it's possible, we are supposed to become like him. And, you know, what did it really mean to become a man? At this point, mankind had put, had basically delivered themselves over to Satan. Yes. Now, he wasn't a subject of Satan, of course. Yes. But he was a subject of the temptation. Because we're told he was tempted in the same way. Yes. Probably even greater, and I've heard sermons on this, because when we are tempted and we fail and succumb to that temptation, well, the temptation stops because we've, but he never succumbed to it. I mean, so his temptation or, or the assailment of Satan against him never ended until the cross because he never gave in. But see, more than that, <clears throat> everything was at stake here for Satan. Yes, see, it was. when yes. Satan tempts you and me to sin, so what? Yeah. What does he gain? Nothing. He may succeed in destroying me and you, but this had to do with Satan being right. And he wanted to be right. And so he left nothing undone to try to make Christ sin. And so he mercilessly pounded him and pounded him and pounded him, trying to get him to lose his temper or become impatient, impatient or become do hungry. something to deliver himself from the torture that he was going through because... Mm -hmm. Had he been able to do that, then Satan could have brought forward, see, I was right. Mm -hmm. But with you and I, he didn't gain anything really by doing that mm -hmm. other than he just delights in hurting Christ. Well, I, he hadn't, well, yes and no, because this entire battle between Christ and Satan is about each individual. Each one he gains, he wins part of the battle. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the overall war, Christ ended on the cross. But there are individual battles that he's winning every day when he gets someone on his side. Amen. Yeah, it is the battle for the mind, isn't it? It's not a battle for this rock of a planet. No. It's a battle for the people. Yeah. For allegiance. Yeah. Okay, on Monday's lesson, <coughs> you know, the question asked... Uh, why do you thank Peter and John but actually the scripture referred to Andrew it says so why do you think Peter and Andrew were willing to make such a radical commitment to follow Christ what in the text indicates that Jesus was calling them to a higher purpose than catching fish and that scripture is Matthew 4 18 to 20 it says and Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brethren Simon and called Peter and Andrew his brother, cast in that into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. You know, it doesn't say it here, but there's other texts that think it. I believe those nets came in completely full of fish. And he goes, See, I'll make you fishers of men. And that, was, that hit them. <laughs> and I think what they left them, they left that huge pile of fish for somebody else mm -hmm. I could be wrong but there's other texts where he told them to cast nets and they came in mm -hmm. bursting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, something made not just his words something made an impact on them right there 
Um, we'll see someday. Yeah, right. We'll know more. Well, obviously, on. they recognized to some degree, not fully, but um, who was making the call to them. And uh, even though they, as well as us, have their faults, they were sincere hearted and they wanted to follow God. And, you know, Christ even made the statement, you know, I know my sheep and they know me. They hear my voice and they follow me. And that's mm -hmm. what they did. They did respond to him. They followed him. They heard his voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, why do we want to assume that those nets are empty like I always have all my life? <laughs> <coughs> you know, we, we make an assumption either way. I think it's more of a blessing to assume they came in full and they recognized the power of Jesus. And he said, I will make you fishers of men. So they saw they will catch men in a way they just caught fish. Yeah, they knew that he was a fisher of men, didn't they? They saw it, they had seen it. They knew him. Well, they knew right there his words had impact. Yeah. And yeah. it would change the world. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah, we and and, and, and they may have had a misunderstanding of how. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. John. Yes, I sir. I think that um if you go to Matthew um, you can see how when Christ is telling the disciples about the householder and he had the vineyard and he hired the people and they all got the same pay and they were saying, oh, you're unfair. His point was, my kingdom is not of this world. I can do with my reward as I choose. You know what I mean? To the, yes. to the I think that Christ knew the temptation that was coming for John and James and their mother because he's taking the 12 after that, after the vineyard owner's parable. He's taking the 12 and he tells them, I'm going to be crucified, very plainly, step by step. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to be turned over to the Gentiles, da 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 The very next thing that you hear is James' mother asking if they can sit on either side of his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so I've always wondered, you know, why didn't the disciples hear it when Jesus is saying it? Well, they were enraged because of that prideful request. You know what I mean? And so, yes, like Andrew and Peter, they followed him. All of them followed him. They still had their flaws, like you were saying. And so it was a journey with them, with Christ, to continue submission of themselves to God's will. And after the cross is when they could actually achieve that. For sure, because they all initially, um, even though Judas and the other disciples recommended him, all of them were self-seeking in their joining with Christ because they'd been trying to think that Christ was going to come and set up a kingdom on this wor world or earth and they were going to be, you know, his right-hand man and all this stuff. And they all thought that. <clears throat> the only difference was is the 11 of them, it was hard, but step by step they surrendered to that that's not the issue here, but Judas, he never would. You know, he continued to seek his own honor and glory and wanted the highest position, and when he found out that there was nothing to be gained after that, he said, well, I'll put Christ to the test. I'll force him to make his kingdom and set it up, or there's nothing to it, and I have nothing else to gain or to lose, and so I'm going to put an end to this right now. And he showed his character and what he was about, and then the unfortunate thing, shortly after that, he took his own life. Well, and that's, that's the... That's the part that we have to retain as Christians is how Christ was so um, in sync with God was he did the will of God. Well, to do the will of somebody, you have to be in constant communication with them. And so I think that that's our challenge here. We don't have to do some huge thing. We have to be in constant communication with the Father. You know? Yes, yes. Anyone else? Yeah, but, uh, to go back to what you said, Tim, uh, you know, he, if, if you don't know his will, if you stay in his word and you spend time with him and you stay connected, he'll make his will known to you. Yes, he will. <coughs> okay, on the lesson helps, let's go to Monday. It says, when Christ called his disciples to follow him, he offered them no flattering prospects in this life. He gave them no promise of gain or worldly honor, nor did they make any stipulations as to what they should receive. To Matthew, as he sat at the receipt of customs, and the Savior said, follow me, and he arose and followed him. 
Matthew did not, before rendering service, wait to demand a certain salary equal to the amount received in his former occupation. Without question or hesitation, he followed Jesus. It was enough for him that he was to be with the Savior, that he might hear his words and unite with him in his work. And then a little further it says, Christ in his life on earth made no plans for himself. He accepted God's plans for him, and day by day the Father unfolded his plans. So should we depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will. As we commit our ways to him, he will direct our steps. You know, I was sort of thinking about the disciples anyway, and I don't know the exact facts about all of them, but I know that apparently John and his brother were quite young, and they said that I think John was the youngest of all the disciples, and I'm assuming all of them were at the most probably no older than Christ was, and so they were still young men. And, I mean, I can identify with this. When you're young and you think you have your whole life before you, you know, you have all kinds of plans and visions of grandeur, and you're going to do this, 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 and this. And I think it's kind of amazing how at a young age that, they, you know, they learn their lesson. They humbled themselves right after the death of Christ, and they became like him. They gave up their own selfish plans, and they submitted to uh, be allowed to work for the kingdom of God in their lives. And you know, we uh, as adults, and especially probably if you're over 50 or getting close to 60 years old, you know, you've lived most of your life. And, you know, that, if nothing else, for most people, uh, a lot of times causes you to change your priorities because, you know, you don't have, <laughs> you know, another 30 or 40, 50 years to live because you've already lived that long. And how much more time do you really have? And so you begin to think about eternal things possibly more than you would have at a real young age. So, uh, something just came to mind. Earlier you, we were talking about um, you know, being tempted, and you said you know, if you were tempted to fail, it wouldn't be the same. But, but think of this in the light of the lesson. Each person that falls, it's not just about them. It's about their influence and how many people would have, if they hadn't have fallen, been influenced for good? And how many people, because they did fall, are now influenced by their fall that will fall after them? Mm -hmm. we're, never, we're never an island. That's correct. You know, everything that happens, you know, Ellen White said that um, just like if you throw a pebble into a lake or a body of water, no matter how, how small, there'll be a ripple that hits every bit of the shoreline. The influence we have ripples through the world in ways we don't know through other people. And so when we do fall, it's not just about us. It's about our influence. When we do witness for Christ, it's not about just that one person. It's about the influence that will spread. And so it's not insignificant in either way. And, and that's why Satan works so hard at the end, because as the end gets closer, the significance gets greater in the influence. I mean, look how today we are able to, with social media and everything else, touch people so fast with our thoughts and our influence in ways that would never have happened, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Okay. <clears throat> on Tuesday's lesson, said, When Paul accepted, his whole life was radically changed. Christ gave him an entirely new future. He led him out of his comfort zone to experience he could hardly have imagined. Mm. Through the Holy Spirit's guidance, the Apostle Paul proclaimed the word of God to thousands throughout the Mediterranean world. His witness changed the history of Christianity and the world. And it says, how do these verses reveal that Jesus had a divine purpose for Paul's life? Verse 17, <clears throat> let's see. All 
All right, it says, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So it's pretty obvious that uh, God directed him and what happened there. Mm-hmm. Well, how hard do you think it would be for him to have called him Brother Saul? <laughs> or even hard. to literally go in and touch him and be right there in front of him when he's known to have persecuted and killed or been the instigator of having multiple Christians killed for some time. You know, the interesting thing that I, I contemplate is, you know, how uh, God got his attention. Yeah. You know, he doesn't usually go to those extremes with people. No. Um, you know, the Holy Spirit said strives with every man, and, and many he, you know, lets them make their own choices and, uh, you know, kind of leaves them alone. He doesn't usually tap you on the shoulder that directly. Yeah. In other words, you cut you right down there and you're blind and you're on the ground and you can't do anything, you can't see. But, but uh, look, He got but, his attention, did he not? Yeah. But look what he did. He put him helplessly into the hands of his enemy. Yeah. I mean, when he came, he saw him. Of course, he was completely in power over Saul physically. I mean, he was blind and helpless. Yeah. So it was by the spirit that love came about. Otherwise, you know, they could have said, you know, we're done with him, whack, you know. Um, Our our enemy's gone. But this showed the love and spirit of God coming from them. And then then it says his sight was given, and then he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So at that point, he was still not filled with the Holy Spirit. He He was struggling, and he was weak. Okay, in the middle of Tuesday, it says Jesus often chooses the most unlikely candidates to bear witness to his name. Think of the demoniacs, the Samaritan woman, a prostitute, a tax collector, and Galilean fishermen, and now a fierce persecutor of Christianity. These were all changed by grace and then sent forth with joy in their hearts to tell the story of what Christ had done in their lives. Each never tired of telling the story. What Christ had done for them was so marvelous that they had to share it. They could not be silent. Well, didn't Jesus say that the person that's forgiven the most will end up loving the most? Yeah. So you have to ask the question, then, what about us? I mean, if Jesus is able to do that for them, what about us? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> And the lesson helps, it said, point after point, Paul lingered over in order that those who should read his epistle might fully comprehend the wonderful condescension of the Savior in their behalf, presenting Christ as he was when equal with God and with him receiving the homage of the angels. The apostle traced his course until he had reached the lowest depths of humiliation. Paul was convinced that if they could be brought to comprehend the amazing sacrifice made by the majesty of heaven, all selfishness would be banished from their lives. He showed how the Son of God had laid aside his glory, voluntarily subjecting himself to the conditions of human nature, and then had humbled himself as a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, that he might lift fallen man from degradation to hope, joy, and heaven. Paul's heart burned with a love for sinners, and he put all his energies into the work of soul winning. There never lived a more self-denying, persevering worker. The blessings he received, he prized as so many advantages to be used in blessing others. He lost no opportunity of speaking of the Savior or of helping those in trouble. From place to place he went, preaching the gospel of Christ and establishing churches. Wherever he could find a hearing, he sought to counteract wrong and to turn the feet of men and women into the path of righteousness. Now, I'd read something uh, in the spirit of prophecy that said other than Christ, there was nobody that lived as selfless of a life 
as uh, Paul did. Yeah. Well, um, you know, the pastor has alluded on things recently about being thankful. And I heard something on, and this was on Hope Sabbath School, not this week, but last week, and it was uh, the story of, you know, the lepers and the one that came back, and it said, and worshiping him fell at his feet giving thanksgiving. And they made a point, and I think they're absolutely right. Worship should be all about being thankful. Mm. It's all about thanking God for what he's done. Our love is because we're thankful for what he's done. Amen. We're thankful for what he's given. If it's not, is it really worship? Now, I'm not talking about, you know, the, the praise where we, you know, it, it's just uh, entertainment. I'm talking about true thanksgiving. And that's what Paul had. He was thankful mm. to, to Christ in his heart. And he wanted to bless others. Um, that's a different perspective for me on what it means to worship from what I've kind of understood my whole life. You know, it's more been about, I don't know, like, because God is God, we worship him. But no, that's not the purpose. The whole purpose that Jesus was glorified and all these things, if you look at the description, it's because we're thankful for what he's done. We're yep. thankful for his sacrifice. We're thankful for his mercy. We're thankful for his love. And in heaven, we will throw our crowns at his feet in thanksgiving to right. him. That's why he's worthy. It's not because of anything innate within himself. It's because we are thankful for him. For him. And I think we lose touch of that a lot here and now. But isn't that what it's all about? Okay, Wednesday, <clears throat> the demands of love. Love always manifests itself in action. Our love for Christ compels us to do something for lost humanity. Paul stated it clearly when he said to the church at Corinth, for the love of Christ compels us. Christianity is not primarily giving up bad things so that we can be saved. Jesus did not give up bad things in heaven so that he could be saved. He gave up good things so that others could be saved. Jesus does not invite us merely to give our time, talent, and treasures to his cause. He invites us to give our lives. At the bottom of the page, it says, Divine love is actum, active, not passive. Genuine love is more than a warm feeling, more than a nice idea. It involves commitment. Love compels us to act. It leads us to reach out to a lost world of God's children in desperate need. When Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs, it was both a command and a comforting reassurance. The master calls for a response of love, and he also encourages Peter that he still had a work for him to do, even despite Paul's truly or Peter's truly shameful action when Jesus had been arrested. Peter now, or Peter not only denied knowing Jesus exactly as Christ had hold, told him that he would do, but Peter also denied it with curses as well. The point, you may have desperately failed your Lord. You may have denied him by your actions more than once. The good news is that grace is still available, and God is not done with you yet. There's still a place in his work for you, if you are willing. Well, okay, the lesson helps. <clears throat> it says, The love of Christ, said Paul, constraineth us. This was the actuating principle of his conduct. It was his motive power. If ever his order in the path of duty flagged for a moment, one glance at the cross caused him to gird up anew the loins of his mind and press forward in the way of self-denial. In his labors for his brethren, he relied much upon the manifestation of infinite love and the sacrifice of Christ with its subduing, constraining power. John, that's the amazing thing is how he dealt with you know, so the woman that was accused and they were trying to get him to stone her and he wrote their sins in the sand. How did he treat her even though he knew she was flawed and faulty? He treated her with love and respect even though her actions may have not 
you may not have deserved that type. You look at um, any time, like with Peter, when he, after Peter had denied him, when he's with him after that, he's very gently emphasizing three times, do you love me? You know what I mean? Like he was, he was changing Peter, but he was doing it in a loving manner and not in necessarily a public manner. You know what I mean? He didn't chastise him and shame him. He didn't talk to the woman until all the other people had left. You know what I mean? And so it, Jesus was very gentle with sinners and called them to change. And thus you see Mary, who may have been that woman, bathing his feet with oil and her tears and her hair and all of that. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just amazing. That's the type of love that he fostered within them. And when they saw that love, they wanted to reciprocate it. You know, that makes me think um, about a statement. I believe it's in Steps to Christ. But it says that, and it used the friends, and it said the drunkard is told that his sins uh, will exclude him from heaven. But she says that pride and selfishness and covetousness are sins that are uh, most offensive to God. Yes. And she says these things go unrebuked. And I'm learning as I contemplate these things, see the person that is full of pride and self-sufficiency and he thinks he's righteous, God can do absolutely zero with that person until he can somehow get his attention. The person that we view as being falling into grosser sins, committing adultery or doing who knows what, just because that is their particular sin doesn't mean that that person is unreceptive to the Holy Spirit. It does not mean that they are not kind, tender-hearted people and that they don't love their fellow man and are interested in helping them. And I think that it's easy to think that as it referred to the drunkard, these sins that are considered more gross sins or more immoral, that the person is less likely to be willing to be worked with and nothing could be further from the truth, just like the Samaritan woman. Right. You know, Christ told her, hey, go I'll call your husband. And he, she said, well, I don't have a husband. So she was living a very immoral life. Right. And as soon as Christ revealed himself to her, she immediately responded to it and went and told everybody, and well, she was a changed person. So that indicates to me that she wasn't this evil, hardened person right. that many might have thought that she possibly was. She just didn't know the truth. Here people yes. were constantly exposed to the truth, wouldn't even open up to him about the truth and let it come in. It's no different than us, though, John. We're the church of Laodicea that's rich and in need of nothing. You know what I mean? And so that's, a, that's our danger. So we got to counteract that and be sensitive to it. Yes. Anyone else? We're about out of time. Well, I mean, I look at Peter here, and, uh, you know, he had... A, a piece of that because he, you know, of course he said I'm not going to deny you no matter what but then in his pride he put himself in a situation where he was around the people to deny was he not the rest of them were hiding out and scattered he felt self-sufficient enough he didn't need to do that he wanted to find out what's going on he went out in the crowds he went out wherever you know and they're like hey Aren't you one of them? And at that moment, you know, of course, after he had put himself in a situation he shouldn't have been in, he denied Christ. He learned from that. You know, Christ asked him three times, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Yes. Well, when he denied him, was he feeding the sheep or was he actually casting doubt and influencing the wrong direction? Mm. Well, good point. Amen. <clears throat> let's bow our heads for prayer our heavenly father we bow now before you in the name of jesus father we want to thank you for sending jesus to die for us and we also know that um in your word that one of the reasons you have not come yet is because you said you're not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance and i just pray father that we would humble ourselves and surrender ourselves to you that we can rightly represent you to those that are around us and not only that, Father, uh, I just pray for us and for your people that your patience and your long-suffering for us will not have been in vain, but that we will fully accept you and be your children and be ready to meet you in peace when you come. And we thank you again for everything that you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.